In Brussels today, four Northern Ireland parties who supported Remain in 2016 went to see Michel Barnier. They seek influence on Brexit at a time when their rivals, the DUP, hold so much sway at Westminster. The DUP do not speak for citizens in the North. The majority of citizens in the North, we certainly do. We wanted to see the special and unique relationship which we have on our island respected and maintained into the future. That we need to, that we can't withstand being outside of the customs union and the single market. Well, today is Good Friday, and I think for the people of Northern Ireland, it will be a very Good Friday. The struggle is to preserve the 1998 Good Friday Agreement and its principle of no hard border between North and South, while also preserving the union between Britain and Northern Ireland. The impossible, perhaps. But yesterday, the Irish Prime Minister in Brussels too said a deal on Brexit in Ireland could be struck within two weeks. I'm very keen to see uh, an agreement uh, concluded um, by November, uh, if at all possible. Um, I think that's in the interests of Ireland, of the European Union uh, and of the UK. And he urged Theresa May quickly to produce her revised plans for the so-called backstop. Have you seen any new proposals from the UK? The safety net to avoid a sudden hard border in case it takes time for Britain and the EU to agree their long-term relationship. The EU's backstop plans involve Northern Ireland staying within the customs union and much of the single market. Some see that, though, as a hard border instead down the Irish Sea, though some checks exist there already. Northern Ireland, because it's obviously a separate island, is part of one unit for animal health. So animal products going across the Irish Sea are already checked to make sure that disease that exists in Great Britain can't cross over to the whole of Ireland. Um, the question is, can you expand those checks so that we ensure, the checks are already happening, there's just more of them to ensure that anything going from GB meets the EU's rules. Would the DUP go along with that though? So they've said no. Are we looking at the real government? <laughs> and the 10 DUP MPs, of course, are crucial to the survival of Theresa May in office. No wonder she reaffirmed this week she can't accept any deal which separates Northern Ireland from the rest of the UK. And we will never break up our country. Agreeing the Irish backstop in the next few weeks is fundamental to the whole withdrawal agreement. Without it, the other parts of the deal, the divorce bill, citizens' rights and the transition period, can't be signed off either. And we'd face the prospect of full Brexit next March with no deal. Well, I've been speaking to Simon Coveney, the Irish Foreign Minister and Deputy Prime Minister here in Cork. He was at the launch of Getting Ireland Brexit Ready, a series of government workshops that will be held throughout October, helping small businesses prepare themselves for life after Brexit. I began by asking him if anything had changed in Ireland's negotiating position. The Irish position has been consistent for a very long time. Uh, uh, we want the closest possible relationship between Britain and Ireland and Britain and the EU in the future. That's in our interests. We believe it's in Britain's interests too. But there are some specific Irish issues that we have raised uh, and we have got assurances on from the British Prime Minister to her credit uh, that need to be resolved in these negotiations. We need to protect the peace process on the island of Ireland. We need to protect the Good Friday Agreement, which is the foundation of that peace process. We need to ensure that as an unintended consequence of Brexit, we don't see the re-emergence of physical border infrastructure on the island of Ireland, which has a corrosive effect on relationships. In the absence of agreeing something better in terms of the future relationship that could solve all these problems, which of course is what everybody would like, uh, then a backstop would be agreed to. In other words, uh, and what that is, is that Britain has said that it would maintain full alignment with the rules of the customs union and single market in the areas necessary to protect north-south cooperation, an all-island economy and the Good Friday Agreement. It's a little bit like Peter Robinson said, you know, you don't ever expect that your house is going to be burnt down, but you do take out fire insurance. If there's a special case for Northern Ireland, why can't there be a special case for the United Kingdom? Northern Ireland is different on many levels. Uh, it has an international treaty which is the basis for the peace agreement there. 
Uh, it has uh, a birthright to Irish citizenship or British citizenship, depending on what people choose. Uh, it has uh, a devolved government structure which is different to anywhere else in the world on the basis of, Good Friday, uh, of the Good Friday Agreement, which requires both uh, communities to be represented in that devolved government structure. So when some Conservative politicians like Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg say the tail is wagging the dog or, you know, that this issue has got blown out of all proportion, what do you say back? I always say when I'm confronted with comments that Boris Johnson has said or Jacob Rees-Mogg has said, uh, you know, or indeed, you know, on Patterson or other people, you know, find people who I know and who have worked and I've worked with in other areas. Uh, I believe that um, that they are not describing the full picture or its complexity in the context of of Ireland and the challenges that we face here. If Theresa May comes back and says the backstop is that the whole of the United Kingdom remains in the customs union then that's acceptable and that's fine and we can move on to the transitional period. Well, look, I mean, we're trying to get a backstop text now finalised over a sort of a, a two or three week period. No one is proposing border infrastructure down the Irish Sea here or anything like it. But checks, when um, you're saying the border infrastructure, I mean, you do want checks in the sea, don't you? Well, first of all, can I say there are already checks between Northern Ireland and the United Kingdom. What we're talking about is building on the existing checks, but to an absolute minimum to ensure that there is no effective barriers to trade at all uh, between the United Kingdom and, uh, between all of the United Kingdom, Northern Ireland and the rest. But everyone's trying to understand what, what is the thing that unlocks the door? Is it, in your view, Theresa May persuading her partners in the DUP to accept more checks? Both Theresa May and the Irish government need to listen to all parties in Northern Ireland. This isn't about one political party in Northern Ireland holding a veto over this process. But the people pushing this Canada plus 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 deal are telling the British people that we don't have to be in the single market, we don't have to be in the customs union, and we don't have to be rule takers. We don't have to sign up to European rules. Well, Is it possible to have all those three things and not have a border in Ireland? You can't say we're leaving the single market, the customs union and the European Union. We're going to do our own free trade agreements across the world. And by the way, you have to allow us seamless access into your market too. When we try to derive competitive advantage from leaving. Um, why would the EU ever facilitate that? So are you preparing to, um, to, to, to look at new border checks? Oh, yeah. Are you, are you recruiting new Absolutely. border checks? Absolutely. Border so, I mean, we, have made a, we already have made the decision uh, that Ireland will take on uh, 1,077 extra customs officials uh, and veterinary inspectors and food safety inspectors in our ports and airports for east-west trade, that is. The people who say there's no problem with a no-deal Brexit also say precisely this. They say we wouldn't erect a border and we don't believe Ireland would either, yeah. so there is no problem. But that is a crazy argument. We have to operate and negotiate on the basis of the British government that is in place at any given point in time. When a British Prime Minister gives a commitment to the EU and to another country, i.e. Ireland, if there's a change of Prime Minister, I would expect that the commitment that was made on behalf of Britain will still main, uh, be maintained as a British commitment. Do, do you think there is a real risk if this were to go wrong and the border was suddenly having to be manned of a return to violence? I don't think we're likely to see the kind of violence that we saw up to 20 years ago. Uh, where uh, people were murdered and maimed, uh, where bombs were a regular feature in the Irish and British news, uh, where families still haven't recovered from the trauma uh, of those times, uh, and when the hatred and bitterness in Northern Ireland meant that people couldn't actually live next door to each other without building physical walls to keep people apart. That's what we're talking about when we talk about what Northern Ireland looked like 20 years ago. Uh, and that is why when people make silly comments uh, about dismissing Irish issues or Northern Irish issues uh, as nothing to do with Brexit, as tail wagging dogs, uh, or as the Irish border question being no different to the uh, boundaries between two boroughs in London, why that is such nonsense. Um, many unionists are fearful that the solutions to solve these complex problems may create new barriers between Northern Ireland and what they regard as the rest of their country in Britain. But also on the nationalist side, they regard the threats uh, and uh, um, concerns around Brexit as potentially creating barriers between where they live and what they regard as their own country too. 
uh, it is a, a fragile construct that we need to protect so that we don't go backwards. I don't believe anybody, whether they be in the DUP or Sinn Féin or the SDLP or the UUP or the Alliance Party, wants to see that progress undermined. Simon Coveney, thank you very much. Thank you. From the Vikings over a thousand years ago to tech invader Apple more recently, Cork has always attracted entrepreneurs and traders. But at the port in Ireland's second city, Donald Crowley sees Brexit as taking us backwards. Do you remember what it was like to work in shipping before the European Union and yeah, you know, all, all the bureaucracy? Yeah, I, I, I worked to with, before I worked with the Port of Cork, I worked with international companies and they had their own shipping department where they had a number of staff preparing the sad documents for the export and import of goods and it was just a lot of very complicated. The thought of delays on loading ships thanks to new customs and tariff formalities has Donal and his shipping clients worried. If you take a, a, a vessel like what's behind us on the quay here, importing animal feed into the Republic of Ireland, right now if that cargo is coming from the UK, the cargo come off, can come off the vessel with normal documentation. Unfortunately, when uh, the UK leaves the uh, customs union, the duty will have to be paid on that cargo before it can be cleared and released into the Republic of Ireland. So that, that, could, duty. that could cause delays then? It could cause delays for, uh, for cargo such as that. So obviously, of course, uh, we're, we can't offload that cargo and it's cleared by customs going into the future. At the Getting Ireland Brexit Ready conference today, some are only just getting to grips with it happening at all. Me personally, up to now, I always had a feeling that there was going to be a, a reverse vote, that the, the people's vote and people would, would in the UK would vote to reverse. But after today, I'm kind of going, that, that's not on the table. This is happening. From an agricultural point of view, Brexit is going to have a huge impact. There seems to be more squabbling within parties and within government and within parliament than anything else. Do you think farmers are nervous here? Very. I'm a great believer in relationships. And I really do think that the strength of people and relationships will overcome the difficulties um, that we will face in this. And Cork may yet attract businesses relocating from the UK in search of a home in the single market. But it's hard to prepare when nobody knows what they're preparing for. Well, joining me now is Sean Gallagher, an independent candidate in the forthcoming Irish presidential election. Anne Doherty is chief executive of Cork City Council. And Alan Kingston is the owner of Glenillan Farm, successful dairy business uh, that sells into the UK as well. What are you worried about? How's Brexit going to affect you? Do you know? Well, like many Irish producers who uh, produce great food and supply into the UK, we are worried uh, about the outcome of Brexit. And actually... The biggest problem is we don't know what the outcome will be. So there's a lot of uncertainty around and uh, we just really hope that uh, common sense maybe prevails. At the end of the day, we've been long-term trading partners. So we hope that uh, there will be good common sense and we will, we will, we will continue to trade uh, as close as possible to what we currently trade Are in. prices of your yoghurt going to go up in British shops? I don't know. <laughs> I hope not. Um, but the reality is that if there are uh, uh, trade tariffs, that uh, it could be anything from 3, 20 or even up to 50 percent, sometimes uh, even on cheese, uh, which we have seen. So nobody knows. And that's the problem. We hope not, because uh, we, we, we like people to think that we can uh, people can afford our yogurts and that they're not very expensive. And Doherty, I mean, do you see this as an opportunity? Yes, um, we're standing in the beautiful city of Cork, Ireland's second city biggest growing city region that Ireland has to offer for the next 20 years. Um, huge reputation in uh, science, technology and fantastic clusters in pharma. But who do you think you'll attract? I think we'll attract multiple uh, people. I think there are British companies who will still want some European base. We're English speaking. We are at the most friendliest place to do business, according to FDI magazine. So I think that's one piece we will so attract. British businesses who want to quit yes. Britain? Well, not want to quit Britain, but they may want to have an Irish offering equally within the EU post uh, Brexit. Um, Sean Gallagher, what's your take on Brexit? What's going to be the effects on Ireland? Because a lot of British Brexiteers kind of think Ireland's talking tough. Actually, you've got masses to lose from a, from a no deal and you're, you know, you're talking tough, but you'll, you'll just go along with anything at the end. Well, I think one thing is clear, that whatever the outcome of the European Council's meeting in the coming weeks, 
is that Ireland will continue uh, to have a relationship with the UK and the UK will continue to be our most significant trading partner and also our closest neighbour. So we need to continue that relationship. And I think the Irish government is very clear in their stance, and it's one that I would support, is that we can never see the return to a hard border. And I grew up literally miles from the border in the shadow of the military checkpoints. And uh, we just can never, ever countenance a return to that for social, economic and political reasons. I mean, that's something I put to Simon Coveney earlier today. And I said, you know, because you're saying you cannot have a return to a, to a hard border, does Britain need to worry then? I mean, you know, because if, if there is a hard Brexit, some of the Brexiteers just say, well, we're not going to put up a border. No. Ireland's not going to put up a border. What's the fuss about? Well, I have spent a number of years on uh, the, inter the north-south trade body between the north and the south, set up under, under the Good Friday Agreement. And I'm very clear from an Irish context that we need to be building bridges between the communities in the north and the south rather than building borders. Um, when, when you sort of see the politicians representing you, do you have faith in their ability to deliver? I would like to see uh, more action. I'd like to see more positivity. Uh, I think there is a, there is always a way forward, and we have to see that there. We have to have faith in them. There is nobody else to do it but the politicians. So they have to come up with some form of agreement. But you you, you heard Anne there talking about this being an opportunity. I mean, for businesses like you, this is about limiting the damage, isn't it? Absolutely, and we have I to. I mean, there is no upside, is what I mean for you. I mean. So, well, there are there are some upsides, I suppose. There what are, are they? well, there's quite a few imports of uh, of uh, yogurt in particular actually come into Ireland. So this hurts both sides, and there's no good outcome for anybody here. And uh, we want to see positive relations relationships continue right throughout the thing. There's four billions worth of product come in from the UK into Ireland. Uh, we have five billions worth of uh, export. So the relationship is two-way, and we have to work something out. Sure, Sean Gallagher, I mean, you, you, you said openly that, you know, you want to work towards a United Ireland. Do you think Brexit helps you in your cause? I think the most important um, objective I would have is to see a unification of the people of the island. And uh, what we need to do is build relationships and build the trust that will create the environment where all traditions can live inclusive and, and in harmony. And that is not about putting up new borders. That is about building relationships and building the trust. Slightly avoiding my question, Sean. Sure. No. I mean, do, do you think it helps your campaign? I mean, because, that, you know, there is you know, a, a situation here in which you could see some new regulatory checks between uh, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, new checks in the Irish Sea. That's heading your way, isn't it? I think it's just as Alan said, it's about the uncertainty that we have. And it's, it's, it's compounded, Christian, by the fact that the Northern Ireland Assembly isn't functioning. And so we have a vacuum and we don't have that local leadership. And I think until all of these things, you know, work their way through, we don't have certainty. But what's very clear in my mind is that we, we need to be building these relationships rather than putting up boundaries and barriers and, and borders between them. Just briefly, I mean, from where you sit here, I mean, we're right at the other end of the country to the border. Do you feel there is a real risk? of the hard border coming back and, and, and things developing from there, a return to the bad days. I, I think that um, our politicians on both sides are very sensible people who want to do the right thing and nobody wants to do harm to a relationship that's built up over many, many years between Ireland and the UK. So I, I'm not concerned that there will be because I don't think that will be allowed to happen by the people who are negotiating on both our behalves.